you know, it, and when you, when you go through a vulnerability assessment, the first thing you have to figure out is what, you know, what, what are you assessing to, right? I mean, if, if you just walk in and you start doing a vulnerability assessment, that's useless unless you actually know what standard or regulations or baseline you're trying to match up against. Um, you know, so that said, is it going to be NERC SIP? Is it going to be DHS or, uh, yeah, DHS CFATS? So when we look at, uh, you know, doing a vulnerability assessment versus a pen test, a vulnerability assessment is just that. You're trying to find vulnerabilities, but you aren't going to actually try to realize them. You're not going to actually try to see if the vulnerability uh, can be uh, um, exploited. That's penetration testing. So, you know, when we went further in the demonstration talking about the Metasploit modules, that was penetration testing. You perceived there was a vulnerability because it's not doing authentication. You looked at how the application worked, maybe you can move it from run mode to stop mode or writing ladder logic to it, and you validated it with a penetration test of developing the modules. Um, so you really have to go through that process of finding out, well, am I doing a vulnerability assessment or a pen test? Vulnerability assessments should be done on a minute-by-minute -minute basis in environments. Uh, not, hey, I'm doing a vulnerability assessment this year or next year or the following year. You're doing a vulnerability assessment every minute as long as you're getting updates from the ICS cert, industrial control system cert, as long as you're reading information about uh, vulnerabilities from certain vendors or anything that you know about your environment. Vulnerability assessments are done uh, all the time. I mean, they're not, it is a constant process. It's not something that should be performed on an annual basis. Um, so you know, realizing how to do that is very important. But of course, it's useless unless you know what cyber assets you have and how they're programmed. So, you know, this is one of my lessons learned. I gave this presentation at the uh, ICS CERT uh, Industrial Control System Joint Working Group, excuse me, not ICS CERT, uh, the Industrial Control System Joint Working Group meeting back in uh, April of 2010. You know, and, and what I wanted to represent was how many times I've asked the questions of finding all the personnel, all the cyber assets, all the documentation, and then I'll ask, is all this documentation that you have, is it current? The people that operate the cyber assets, the vendors that you have contracts with, the cyber assets themselves, how they're connected, how they're configured, is it current? And every time, the response was no. Frequency of zero of being able to have up-to-date documentation on everything in the environment. So literally, if it's not current, you have to find the deltas. You have to figure out what is actually in that environment. Interview the personnel, reviewing documentation, looking at actual engineering schematics, getting an engineering into uh, the process, looking for physical, cyber, and operational security deficiencies. Doing wire tracing. I mean, I personally, I, I bought you know, knee pads. You know, they, these facilities, you're trying to crawl around, trying to figure out where a wire goes, is not that easy of a process. And then when things become wireless, it's even that much harder. And then you'll find wires that essentially will use even old telco uh, communication cables. So the next thing you know, you're at a patch panel, and then you're trying to figure out where the other side of the wire goes. So you're trying to look at 20-year-old schematics that no longer have been updated. So it's, it's not an easy process. So you know, we go through interviewing the personnel, the vendors, the operators, understanding what their cyber physical or uh, uh, security awareness is. I mean, it can be as simple as asking them, you know, what cyber assets or tools do you have manual procedures for? What if that PLC goes away? What if that operator workstation goes away? How can you still manage your environment manually? Can you? What if something happens? How do you operate in a degraded state? So that's, that's a major question to ask uh, immediately. If cyber goes away, what can you still do? What data flows can you still calculate manually? Do you even have the logic and programming capabilities to do it? Or are you, are you failed? Are you no longer a sustainable or viable business at some point? You know, when you look at documentation, you're going to find shared infrastructure. Right? I picked down municipalities, but you know, when I see a municipality that has their fresh water, wastewater, and their uh, a little bit of generation and then distribution of electricity, maybe even some transmission, all using the same control system server and software and operational environment. And that network is flat, meaning that the security or the access afforded to me out at some field location is the same as I have within a control room that has physical security but the field, the field location doesn't have physical security. 
that's a problem. Because then all of a sudden I can jump onto the network and if I can ping it, I can own it. Right? It's that same model. So that's a risk. Uh, make sure, again, the accuracy of the documentation. Even though you have the, doc the documentation, it doesn't mean that it's accurate. So you want to find ways to ensure the information is viable or correct at that point in time. So an example would be, let's focus on a cyber perspective. If you have a list of firewall rules, go get a firewall and find out if the rules match. If you find one firewall rule that's off in the, in the sampling that you picked, then you have to assume they're all wrong. Go and look for a network switch. And if the documentation says there's only 20 connections and you go to a network switch and there's 21 connections, you have to assume all the connections are wrong. It's a very simple sampling that you can do to figure out whether the environment uh, truly has accurate documentation. Reviewing the engineering schematics. And I'm not going to go through this in, in exorbitant detail because we covered this before. Uh, but it even goes down to the process. I mean, here's an example. We're at an electric utility that... Um, the, uh, these generating units have black start capabilities, meaning if the bulk electric system starts to collapse upon itself, failing, you have to have electricity to make electricity. So these are units that have enough fuel to just crank them up so that you can then use them to start the rest of uh, components of the power grid around that area. And because of um, environmental concerns, they had something called a high-pressure water injection system put into it, which essentially would emit... Uh, water onto the flame, which reduces emissions. Just an interesting engineering model that was there. So my question was, could I compromise that high-pressure water injection system to then control it to then douse the flame? So all of a sudden, all of these generating units wouldn't, would no longer work. Or could I operate the pumps in such a way that they would exceed the engineering specification of the pipes that they were being pushed into? So those are types of engineering questions you could ask to see how it was built. What if it gets operated beyond uh, some of the thresholds? Did you program the thresholds into the ladder logic or into some system? If that's how you limited how the environment operates, well, then that could therefore then be manipulated and then all of a sudden now create a physical uh, condition in the environment. And then do a wire tracing. It's amazing where wires go, but where wires don't go, wireless can go. I mean, I, I, found, I followed a wire for a while, and all of a sudden I found an area where what happened here? Oh, a backhoe cut through it, so we had to put in a wireless repeater. So then all of a sudden, now you're like, well, where'd this wireless come from? Well, it's 900, megah 900 megahertz wireless, and the vendor says it's secure. It is as secure as you buying another wireless repeater from the same vendor, which then picks up the wireless transmission from the other repeaters and then decodes it for you, and now you're in. All you have to do is buy the same hardware. Um, but you have to find out where connections go. Because on the other side is another cyber asset that may be controlling it or may be receiving some kind of commands or control from it. And then how it's configured. How is it actually configured? What's the program logic that's in the device itself? And this ultimately is the hardest one to crack because commonly the control environments are configured by a third party vendor. And the third party vendor does not want to share how it's configured because it's proprietary information. It might even be OEM'd directly, where you're not going to be able to change or influence how it's actually configured or designed in the environment, unless, unless you include this within your initial procurement language. You know, and that's where looking at some of the DHS SCADA procurement language um, documentation can be valuable. Um, analyze the network traffic. Figure out who it's talking to. You know, if you can find... Maybe you're going to find additional nodes or cyber assets just by you know, just seeing communication profiles or patterns. What's on the other side of this connection? Who is using it? Oh, there's an additional wire going between these two different facilities. Nobody really thought about that or encountered it before. Oh, there's a VPN connection that goes between here and the headquarters located on the other side of the world just to allow for remote management because company A bought company B, bought company C, and some other back channels are put in place. So looking at network traffic can be valuable. And as we were just talking about, looking at and doing a wireless assessment. But here, this is only valuable if, if you know what frequencies you're looking for. Is it an air to 11 assessment? Is it a 900 megahertz assessment? Is it 314 megahertz? I mean, what frequencies are you going to look at? Good ones as a start, Bluetooth, 900 megahertz, air to 11, Zigbee. Those are a beginning in the control system environments. Uh, as well as 
GSM and, uh, and 3G, other cellular communication protocols. Um, higher frequency uh, or lower frequency microwave communications, but then you have to have the right hardware to be able to tap into it. Uh, and then also satellite. Those are the most commonly used. So some general vulnerabilities that you can look at. You know, a lot of the times when you do a vulnerability assessment or a, a site survey, you can just ask the personnel because they typically know a lot of different vulnerabilities. And they may openly disclose them. It's not uncommon. Uh, a lot of times they're standardized deployments, the same IP addresses, the same MAC addresses, the same configuration. So if you find one vendor that has a motor embedded or certain types of automation in place, uh, you go to different asset owners, they'll be deployed the same way across multiple asset owners, even down to having the same MAC addresses on each one of those systems.